So the administration systems, or these administrative systems, or the bureaucracy, or the civil service, and no matter how you call it, although they're not exactly the same thing, but let's call it the administration. What is it? Well, the modern state, back and we go again to the same definitions that you need to know and use correctly. The modern state, right, is what? A set of institutions with exclusive power over the territory and the membership. But what does it mean, set of institutions? And we talked about legislature, executive, so let's just put them here. But they are where? They are in the capital city. So, you know, they can't govern if you only have a set of institutions, a few buildings in, in the capital city, Paris, or Berlin, or Washington, D.C. That that's not governance. That's, they can emit rules and nobody will care, right? What makes this set of institutions actually have and exercise power over this territory and membership is, as I mentioned, this all-encompassing structure of people who execute policy. Right? So here's a cabinet, here's the head of the executive, here's a cabinet minister, and let's just take transportation that we talked about, right? So, or, or finance, right? Finance. So when a policy is made then throughout the country, you know, in each every individual city, each region, like the entire country will be covered by a set of institutions who will be part of this structure, and an order coming from here will be executed by all these throughout the country. This is what the modern administration is. And the modern institution is, you know, it is all-encompassing. It is pervasive. This is, you know, you can't just go in, in and out of a country, right? Why? Because you have an entire system of, of um, uh, institutions that guard that border, right? The, the idea of borders don't exist. We need to understand this thing. Borders do not exist, right? Borders are conventions. But those conventions need to be enforced and enforced every day. So every time you go to that border, 2 a.m., 8 a.m., 12 p.m., whatever, you need to encounter the same border, meaning a set of people who will make sure that this is a border, right? And the same applies to anything, you know, to order, law and order, right? To, to rules of, tra um, um, uh, you know, uh, traffic, traffic rules, right? Traffic regulations. They don't exist, right? If someone passes, a, you know, again, the example, I have just decided to, today that we will pass on yellow from now on, right? Or red or whatever, right? This sentence that I just uh, spoke, admitted, doesn't mean anything unless I have a set of people who will make sure that this is actual reality. And they have the tools, right? Monopoly of violence. Remember our definition. The state is a set of institutions which have a monopoly of violence. Only they can use violence legally, you know, within, you know, uh, on a daily basis. So, and this is, this is a modern state. This is why the birth of the modern state is not, you know, um, uh, you know, it's recent. Because how did the state look before? Well, you didn't have this, very simply. You did not have such an all-encompassing administration. The centralization of power into, into, the, into the, the government, right? It's a crucial part of the birth of the modern state. And the development of so, such bureaucracies that will control the entire state, that's what makes the modern state what it is. This is what enforces the same rules, the same laws, everywhere, throughout the territory, and so on. This is the development of the modern state. What did you have before? Well, you remember our maps, right? The white patches, you know, and uh, uh, that were widespread, uh, you know, on the map of the world, which means, well, didn't people live there? Yes. Uh, and they're not, those white patches are not there because there was snow, right? It's because the, the sources of power, which means what? Which means order were more, were fewer, and they didn't have this sort of apparatus to spread throughout, throughout these, uh, these areas and control it um, uh, universally, right? And when you saw the map of France and the continuation of the existence of this sort of a unit, it meant that there was a centralized power, right? You go on the map and you see, well, there's France in the 15th century, 16th, 17th, what does it mean? These borders, again, they don't really exist, right? If you just go there, you see that not physical, you know, uh, fly over and you'll see where is the, where is the border. So what did you have? You had a, a, a monarch who managed to develop gradually a standing army and then a set of a bureaucracy that managed to, to spread its, his power and in a, uh, you know, um, 
uniform way over the territory. But still, not, bef not until that, you know, the 19th century, basically, do you really have this model of the state that I, that I drew before, the modern state. You know, this monarch, you know, he, his power was here, and then he had relationships with different power holders, right, who, uh, who listened to him, and that's how he basically, who themselves controlled local territories and so on. So that's, you know, it wasn't this. One of the modern, one of the first modern states, modern bureaucratic states, was Prussia, P-R-U-S-S-I-A. And it was, uh, <coughs> it tells you how the, these things develop. Russia was one of the modern bureaucratic states, one of the modern states, because, um, how? Well, first of all, it was a military state, very militaristic, and it had a standing army, unlike, you know, borrowing from the nobles. And because it had a standing army that was, had, was, had garrisons throughout the country, it transformed this system of, and what, what, do you have, what do you know about the army? It listens to commands, right? So this idea that it's an institution, right? From the commander, the same rule would be executed by all the people. That's an institution, right? Well, it's very easy to transform, to move from this, the military, that is garrisoned throughout the country into what? Into a bureaucracy. So they use the existing structure of the military, which was hierarchical and, uh, you know, followed the same goals and the same rules, remember our definition of institutions, they used it to transform it into what? Well, into a bureaucracy. And this is how Prussia became a modern uh, bureaucratic state, because it had a the set of institutions to govern and control the territory and the membership. So, but you're going to ask, maybe, uh, why, why have such a, such a modern state? Well, why have, uh, you know, um, uh, traffic? you know, rules, traffic lights, and so on. Why have posts, post offices and the post system, right? All these things that we consider to be conveniences, law and order, right? 911, that you, the fact that you can call. But go to Somalia and try to call the local 911. Nobody's gonna come, because there is no set of institutions to do that, right? So, all the things that we have, including citizenship, and what does it mean citizenship? A set of obligations, but also a set of Rights, right? We demand that we have this right, that right, and again, these rights don't just exist. These are politically given rights. It's the state that gives you these, these rights. You, you demand them from the state. If you don't have a state to whom, whom, from whom you can request this by virtue of your citizenship, who's going to give it to you? All their natural rights and, you know, divinely endowed rights. Maybe that's the origin and that's your interpretation, but you don't have anything unless there's a set of institutions that give them to you, that confer them to you, certain protections. You know, uh, all these so-called rights are actually a, a relationship between the individual and a set of institutions. And it's a set of institutions that guarantee this. Equality. Well, equality needs to be enforced. And this is our story about the French Revolution. They made everyone equal, what? Through a very strong state with a set of institutions that forcibly made everyone equal. Right? It's not a state, it's not, in a state of nature you would not be equals. Right? It, you need a set of institutions who levels everyone. And that's equality. Even freedom. Right? Freedom is actually a set of rules uh, that, that prescribe that you can do this and this and this equally as the other person. Because if you wouldn't have a set of institutions, the other person would get angry with you that you can do this and he would just um, punch you. And then you couldn't do that. So, the modern state, right? All the equality and all these things that we want, um, you know, um, and everyday things, right? They are provided by a set of institutions. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Uh, but the point is, and this is why we talked about the birth of the modern state, is that it wasn't always this way. It wasn't always this way. This is a recent phenomenon, right? whether you like it or not. You know, public health. Think of Ebola, you know, or Ebola, right? Uh, think of it, right? We want the, the government to do something about it, right? Indeed, right? It, which is about quarantining those who are sick, which is about making sure that the public doesn't get sick and so on. But well, all these are such institutions that do that. If you wouldn't have the set of institutions responding to the whatever, Ministry of Health, 
you could not employ it. And think of all the institutions that are involved in having public health, like vaccination, um, uh, having you know clear, uh, good water to drink, and and uh, sewage, and all these things. So this is how this is one of the these are one of the first things that the modern state did is to well build sewage and create for the possibility for you know to to live a life that is not threatened by the plague every day. And this, only 150 years ago, in London, the plague, or the cholera was raging, even members of the royal family were affected because they didn't have such a system. But this system cannot be made by me and you just be getting together and so on. And, you know, the more, the larger the country it governs, the larger the set of institutions that are, uh, need to do that. So let's talk about the institution. What is, the, what is this institution? The administration. The administration is the machinery containing institutions and these are actual institutions with actual people, you know, here is their uh, <clears throat> the building which they are in various localities so institutions and processes through which the policies of the state are transformed into reality so uh, what is the administration again? is the machinery, right, the, the whole engine of institutions, remember our definition of institutions, and processes, which means rules, ways of doing things, institutions and processes, through which the policies of the state, meaning of the government, are transformed into reality. And here's the connection with what we're talking about. Remember, from idea to bill to law to reality, and that's policy. Well, this connection is when the law is passed, the transformation of <coughs> a law into reality is, is this. And without this, there is no law, and there is no, no order, and there is no government. Because when you say govern, you, you, actually what you mean is policy. Actually what you mean is a system of order. And here's our discussion, or our discussion uh, in political philosophy of the sources of order and how should this order look. You see, it's actually very immediate, it's very true. Because we live in a system, in a, in a system of order, all these rules by which we live, and they're all based on certain conceptions of what conceptions of what the human being is, what is, how should we live together, and so on. Right? So we don't want to think, oh, that's you know just philosophy, as if it's something imaginary. No, it is those very things that tell us what is right and what is wrong, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And most of the times we say, well, everybody knows that we should do this and that. Well, false. Not everybody knows. You do it because you have been taught to do it, and you have learned to do it, but as it's part of a whole philosophy underlying your uh, society in which you live. And laws are part of it. laws are manifestations of these underlying philosophies. Again, think of the Constitution, the creation of independence, think of the assumptions and the philosophy underlying it, and it's not a given. It's just a specific philosophy. Other political systems have other philosophies, and it doesn't mean that they're equal. Because if your philosophy says, you know, kill every woman uh, who you don't like, or kill every child, or, uh, you know, steal whatever you want, you know, just making up some philosophies, you're going to say, well, that's not right, you know. Well, but understand that deciding, think Machiavelli, deciding what is a very statement, the simplest statement saying this is right, this is wrong, this is better, this is worse, that is a statement of order. It tells you what is true, what is untrue. And it tells you what has meaning and what, what doesn't have meaning, what action is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Well, that's back to, to Plato. Back to Aristotle, all the discussions that we talked about. Only that they go to the source questions. Why do we say this is right, this is wrong? So, you know, from administrations, from the DMV or whatever it's called, you know, where you get your license plates and whatever, right, Department of Motor Vehicles, right, actually that is a manifestation of a philosophy. That is a manifestation of order. Those people who put the stamp and stay in line or whatever it is, that's a manifestation of order. And what is this order? These are laws implemented by the government, by the executive. That's the, the world in which we live. That's the reality in which we live. 
So, administration. This is basically, we can call it administration, we can call it civil service, meaning those who are employed by the state, meaning, <clears throat> um, or bureaucracy is another word, but administration is uh, the best word because it encompasses many things, and uh, civil service means something else. Civil service means those who are employed by the government, by the state, right? Because policies can be implemented by people who the state employs directly, or the state can loan out services or duties or responsibilities to private entities. So, you know, it's like contractors. Remember Blackwater in Iraq and whatever, right? These are, you know, private security firms whom the government contracted out certain services to provide law and order, which is, was quite uh, debated at that point, right? So the same can happen to, in different countries, they can loan out or they, there can be a partnership between the, the government and, for example, churches in Germany, for example, it's through churches that social services are provided, and there's, a, there's this part partnership, right? So, that's, it's, policy can be implemented not only through people you, you hire, but also by contracting it out, or entering into partnership with civil society uh, organizations, civil organizations. But the civil service are those people who are specifically employed uh, by the um, um, government. So it's a particular structure to which the administration operates who are directly employed by the state, so know this definition of what the civil service is. So how is the administration or the administrative system uh, organized? We talked about this. They're organized in departments or they can be called ministries or agencies or bureaus, whatever. Right? But each of them deals with something else. So what does the administration do? There are a few major functions that the administration does this administrative system. And I want you to know these uh, functions. So one, it is provision of goods and services. And this you also have in your book. And this is one of the key things that they implement policy by providing things, either goods or uh, services. Um, and um, they can be anything. You know, think of the food stamps, right, and that's very blatant, you know, um, but even the tax return, but not, it doesn't have to be material, right, uh, services like, as I said, DMV, right, they provide this service, right, uh, so providing you, giving you things, post service, whatever, um, is, is an as essential thing of, uh, that an administration performs, because it's the government who, who, who provides those services, right, to whom, through the administration. Two, um, regulation and enforcement. So these are the uh, administrative systems that make rules for your life. For example, a very famous one in, in this political system is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, right? They make rules about, so you open a business, you need to follow those uh, rules. So, so rules for, uh, of behavior. Rules that, again, implement policy. There's a law saying, well, we need to reduce uh, whatever, um, uh, pollution, whatever. This department will take that law and make it into practice, but they will have to emit a series of rules that will follow that goal, right? Laws are not always very specific, right? Uh, so rules and laws, or the IRS, all the rules you have to uh, <clears throat> follow, they're not necessarily in the, in the law, right? In the law it says, well, you, brackets of taxation, right? You enter that bracket, you pay this much tax, but the rules of, well, which form you have to complete and by what, that's, that's made by the, that specific agency, and that's the IRS, uh, Internal Revenue Service. That's a part of the administration, of the administrative system. Then, there is provision of knowledge. And this is, this is key. Because, understand, these are the people who spend their lives doing this thing. They become specialists in their area. So they're the people who know most about these things. This is why they are, have the knowledge that they can impart to the lawmakers, for example. This is why lawmakers in the parliament will call on these civil servants who are specialists in their area, let's say the IRS, or finance, treasury, you know, currency, whatever it is. And they are called to testify and to, well, how should we do this? These are the people who run the thing. So you are going to call on them when you make a new law. And as we'll see uh, briefly, in a, a certain countries, they're the ones who actually make the law. And then, information management.
uh, also because they run these different areas of life, they also have the information, you know, the, they know the size of the um, um, territory, they know the, the number of people who live there, they know the income, they know, I mean, you need to have a set of institutions who um, uh, to collect such such data, and it's the only set of institutions that are able to collect such data. For example, you know, think of the census. Right? The census is a num uh, uh, counting all the people in a, in a in a country. Right? That's that's a huge task. So we need to have an all-encompassing system to do that. But so so it is about you know how much you consume and income and um, uh, territory, you know, land mass and all these things, water, whatever. So information management, collecting, storing, these, this is the only system that has such information about the state. We talk about GDP, gross domestic product and everything. These you know, measurements of the economy, where do you think those numbers come from? They are collected by these existing institutions through which the state functions. And then finally, resource management. Um, in the sense that it... Uh, collects and uh, provide uh, it collects and also produces income. The IRS was an example, right? They collect resources, collect resources from individuals, from uh, companies, right? Companies need to pay taxes, so extracting resources. Uh, but they, there can be other resources in, in certain countries. It's the state manages the natural goods such as coal or electricity. So, uh, resource management, or think of the the coolie dam or whatever dams, right? The resource management. That's, that's in the hands of the, of the state, and we have a whole administrative system doing that. But some companies right, are uh, state-owned. And again, the USPS, the, the Postal Service, uh, it's owned by the government. It's an independent, it's an autonomous agency within the government, and it produces income. It, it makes money, right? Enough money or not, or maybe it needs funding, that's a different story. So these are the five functions that you need to know of that administrative systems uh, perform. So let's talk. Uh, let's uh, say a few words about the bureaucracy, which is, you know, it's used sometimes synonymous, synonymously, but that's not. Although I won't be, you know, it won't be a catastrophe if you do. But let's differentiate. And your book does a good definition and differentiation of this. So what is the bureaucracy? Bureaucracy is a more specific term, and one of the Key thinkers who developed the theory of bureaucracy is Max Weber. And what is the bureaucracy? Right? Well, let's say, let's talk about what it is not. Right? What is? How do you make sure that this actually functions? That this is a, a, a functional state? Well, it's very simple, right? You pass a rule and they execute. But well, it's not simple because these are human beings. These are human beings. What makes you sure that they're not executing? Or they're going to execute it the same way. Or the functionary who's there at the DMV will not say, well, you know, my uncle is there in line, he's going to come up front, and he's actually, I'm not going to charge him, and so on. Nobody, you can't control everyone. Right? Uh, so, the, the human element. So, you see here already the difference. Or think of the policeman who stops you, and there's another example in your book, but that's very common around the world, and a measure of corruption. It's a key word, corruption, right? Is what do you do when you speed, right? Uh, what happens with you when you speed and the policeman stops you? Um, well, you say, well, I'm going to pay, pay a fine, of course. Not really, or not necessarily, and not everywhere, for sure. Very often you're going to just pay a bribe, yes, in many, many countries, many, many countries around the world. So, well, that's not legal, so what? Legal, again, we're thinking that, well, just because a law is emitted, is written somewhere, it doesn't mean anything. Legal. To mean something, you have to have a set of institutions that is functional that make sure that that law is followed and applied. But corruption can be as per uh, so per pervasive that that system that is meant to make laws reality doesn't work. Judiciary doesn't work, the police doesn't work. Again, I, I think I mentioned this example that there are countries uh, around the world where you don't want to call 911 or whatever number they have. because. Well, first, they, don't, they won't show up, so they're going to laugh at you, really, you're just disturbing them, and this is, I'm talking seriously. Or, you don't want to show them up because it's worse than being robbed, because they will uh, ask for bribes and so on. And this is not a fantasy uh, example, uh, imaginary, that I'm telling you. Uh, there was this case in Nigeria, <coughs> where there's some conflicts there, and uh, one 
sort of violent group attacked the village <laughs> and uh, uh, so the army came to, to make a order into the place and a few days later I mean everybody was saying the people who just got attacked I mean killed and houses burned right by, by those uh, rebels whoever they were they were clamoring you know like telling the army go away they were asking <laughs> The government to take the army away because it, it was equally bad or worse than having it's like we're going to just take care of ourselves I don't know what we're going to do but you know we don't need these people with guns here because they're doing the same thing right when it's called the army so you see this is this is you know from the news right minor news oh you don't want to encounter a policeman because you know you're going to have to pay right still in Nigeria this was a former student who told me the story. So, I just gave you some examples of what the bureaucracy shouldn't be, or why, why the bureaucracy we developed this specific concept. And what did I mention? I mentioned corruption, and this is, you know, which can be bribery, right? Bribes, and they're, they're you know, every, it's very interesting to study all the cultures and what words they have for, for bribes, right? Uh, so, corruption, right? Corruption, which means that it doesn't function according to the rule, but it functions for the profit of the... So the rules can be bent, there are no rules, or they can be bent according to, to um, the transactions, the material transactions between the client and the whatever, civil servant. But there's also patrimonialism. Patrimonialism. And that's, that's, a, that's an attitude towards patrimonialism. That's an attitude towards the state in which the state or the institutions of government are looked at or, or treated as your own turf, basically, your own property. So the state becomes the property, is treated as the property of the govern, governor, uh, those who govern. So you have the prime minister who, let's say, we talk about in Nigeria, and one of their major resources is oil um, and huge amounts of money. So guess who controls those resources because they're in the hands of the you know, government, of course, the natural resources. You have to grant different companies the right to you know, uh, exploit them. And, well, guess who controls it? Obviously, whichever party is in government. So the fight for, for government power there is actually a fight for the major source of money in the country, which is oil. And huge, huge, huge amounts of money. So, you know, that's patrimonials. Because I want to be a prime minister because that's where the money is, and real, serious money, because I, I have the, the hand on the faucet. And that's always a problem in countries that have a ma one major source of income, uh, which is a natural resource, because it, then, then it be all becomes a question of who has power and can control that resource. So that's patrimonialism, treating, you, treating the institution, treating the state as your, as your property. Right? And you can do that. I mean, things... Becoming corrupt is not such an extraordinary thing. It's not having them corrupt. It's it's getting out of a system that is crippled by corruption. That is the huge. It's a huge, huge um, task. It's a huge task because you need to have suddenly some people who are willing to be heroes or martyrs, really. You know, some judges or prosecutors or whatever who need who who actually take the law seriously. But they're going to be surrounded by enemies from all, including their colleagues. So. You have that, we have that in, in the history of the U.S., in every country's history, Italy with the fight against the Mafia, how many judges were killed and so on, because, well, this is not, those who weren't killed, well, now you weren't killed because they were playing the law. This is not an easy thing. So patrimonialism, and also patron-client systems, and we're going to get back to this briefly later in the course. So patron-client systems, which is <coughs> patronage and clientelism. I'm going to post a short uh, scanned uh, material about this. So, patron client uh, relationships, patronage, clientism, what simply what it means, it means giving positions in the government by those in power. Let's say a party wins the election, and then it gives the positions here in the, all the people who work in the ministries or here, good paying positions to whom? Not to people who are competent, specialized, but to their supporters. So, that's patronage. And clientelism is, well, it's just two. Uh, two aspects of the same patron-client relationship. That you develop a, a whole clientele, you develop a whole set of people who will support you politically, let's say they're the local labor leader, and that's happened in the US uh, for a long time, 
Chicago and so on, the political machines there. Let's say there's a labor leader <coughs> who can convince his, his guys to vote for you because you promise him benefits or a position in the uh, city hall or, or certain specific contracts or protections and so on. So it's this exchange of political support for, uh, for benefits. So, all these things, right? All these things would make such a system really, it's not a, a, a non dysfunctional, non-functional, and it's no longer a state that you can trust. It's no longer a state that controls the territory. Because you can emit a rule here, and it might be one intention, but it's not going to happen. It's just not going to filter down here. Just not. And trust me, that is a situation in plenty of countries. Plenty of countries. So, <clears throat> so why then bureaucracy? Well, bureaucracy was this sort of a transition from a governance that was basically built around the ruler and listening to the ruler, so it was Basically, a government uh, that had a set of institutions where uh, decision making and uh, governance, extracting resources, all these things, were based on individual decisions and individual relationships. Why is bureaucracy different? Because bureaucracy, according to Max Weber, is has a few things that make it. Uh, so, according to Weber, bureaucracy needs to be uh, rational and legal. So the way in which all this whole machinery functions, I emit a, a rule here, the person here then makes sure, you know, it's a general rule, the person here who is the next deputy prime minister will then send it to his, uh, the other person's, uh, you know, office leader, heads and whatever, and they will make the rules and they will give the commands. So basically you have a whole pyramid from the minister And which and so on and so on. So basically, this rule that starts from here, we know from a law, from a, then a decision by the minister, needs to go through all these key points and, and then be transmitted into other rules. And basically, and this goes from the person who, uh, you know, it gets to an office and from the person who is there at the office desk and picks up the phone and says hello and whatever, to the person who cleans, to the person who makes copies, to the person who goes out in the field to collect resources, to the person who puts the stamps, everybody gets their own role and, and, and uh, uh, task in this process. And this is how a general rule starting here becomes reality because it becomes dissected, fragmented into smaller tasks. But the point is that every single point here in the system, every single individual, every single employee knows their task, knows his or her task, and it's always the same. So I'm the office manager, I pick the phone, I, I, I get the, I register, put numbers on different requests and so on, but that's part of the whole process. You see, it's a whole machinery. And the rules are the same. That's the, this is why it's rational and legal. All these rules come from what is needed to implement this thing and how should we distribute these tasks so that everybody does their task and everybody knows what their task is and so the new rule comes so I just apply my you know I know that you know there's a new law but I keep registering the request in the same way right that's, that's my job here the other person in the office maybe has a more creative job maybe I'm just executing it but still it's a system in which which is based on rationality and on rules on, on legality and what, why is this important? Because if it's all based on rational distribution of tasks, distribution of labor, right, in which everybody knows their job and, and, and performs it, and, and it's, it's a, knows their role and performs it, then this system becomes what? Predictable, accountable, efficient, controllable. All those things that patrimonialism or clientelism or corruption <coughs> does not. This is the opposite. This is why bureaucracy is an important uh, you know, concept, as Max Weber developed it, because he developed it as this ideal. The ideal is literally to, for these institutions to be machines, engines, impersonal, not personal. You know, your identity, whoever is behind the desk at the DMV, and they come, you know, they change shifts and whatever, 
You expect them to, to, to behave the same way, to apply the same rules. But what if, what if every single one, uh, every single person who comes uh, at the, the desk there will have their own rules? They say, no, 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 you actually have to bring me four pictures and a, a chicken, you know, to get a, a license plate. Why? Because I just decided. You see, the, uh, you know, again, it seems exaggerated. It's not. In many places, you do have to bring the chicken to get the whatever, and you don't know what they want. Maybe they want eggs, maybe they want oil, right? And that's, that's the difference, right? So the ideal is, which is never achieved, and I don't know if you want to be, it to be achieved, for this to be uh, like an engine, like a, like a car engine. These are little wheels, and each of them has their own job. And together, they make the car run. That's the ideal, uh, the, the barrier ideal. I'm not sure it is an ideal. So notice a few things then. So, it's rational and legal, which makes it what? Accountable, predictable, controllable. Also, what are characteristics for a bureaucracy is that it, a bureaucracy is hierarchical. So there's a clear hierarchy, right? Boss and underboss and so on. And everyone knows their job, but there is a clear uh, hierarchy because the impulse needs to be transmitted clearly downwards. And this is why the military was such a good tool to develop the bureaucracy for in Prussia. And also, so hierarchical and specialized. So this is where what I mentioned with the division of labor is key. Hierarchical and specialized. So there's a clear hierarchy of orders, like who gives the order, who executes, and, and so on, and how much latitude do you have? You know, I can choose to open between 8 and 4, and I can choose which forms you need to fill out to, to make a, your tax return, right? You see? Hierarchical but specialized, so I it's very needs to be very clear who does what, because then if not it's what well, it's chaos, right? So you need to, a, a very clear division of labor of who does what to, in order to think of it like a recipe. You need to do certain things in a certain order, although there's much more creativity there, in order to have a final product. Think of an engine, right? There is a certain there every tool, every piece, every wheel, every cog does a specific job. So, um, rational and legal, hi hierarchical and specialized, and to summarize, well, it, or to put it differently again from Weber, there are five distinctive characteristics of the bureaucracy. It follows specific rules of action, It is rational, so rules of action, rational, so it's not on a whim, you know, I just don't feel well today, you're not gonna, your tax return is going to be higher. Three, it has to be non-discretionary, non, and you again have these in your, uh, in your book. Non-discretionary, we usually we're farther from the book, but in this case uh, you have many of these things, not all. Non-discretionary, which means that everybody is treated identically, again with the DMV, you know, it doesn't matter which citizen goes there, the, the treatment he receives, the, the papers he needs to fill out, and so on, has to be the same. Four, predictable, well, right, we talked about this, and five, impersonal. And again, this has to do with, you know, whoever is behind the desk there will perform the same function, no matter if they're tall, young, woman, man, race, gender, whatever it is, age, it's impersonal. So this is the idea of machine. So it's based on rules of action, it's rational, it's non-discretionary, um, predictable and impersonal. Are there problems with... Um, can there be problems with the bureaucracy? Yes, of course there can be problems. Because again, as I said, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure right, that uh, we want the bureaucracy to work as a machine, uh, because the machine is perhaps too impersonal. Uh, perhaps there's not enough latitude, and you can get caught in the uh, in the machine and never get out because rules and regulations don't encompass, can't encompass the the complexity of human life. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes you need a few, uh, some latitude and perhaps you don't want every single thing regulated and so on. That's a, a different discussion. But a good book about this, of course, is uh, Kafka's uh, uh, 
Kafka is a famous writer. Kafka is the trial. The trial is basically a person who is get caught up, who gets caught up in a system of rules and regulation, the bureaucracy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was very bureaucratic in the sense that, well, it was very bureaucratic in this sense. Um, so this is kind of a parody. It's not a parody, but it's kind of absurd. Uh, it's taking it to an absurd uh, length. But what you know, the, what happens when you're caught into the system and everybody is just implementing their or doing their role, but no, so nobody has responsibility and they're just executing, and you can just get caught up and eaten up and chewed out. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting parable, so to speak. <coughs> so you see, this is it's it's a key reality of your life. The administrative systems are a key reality of your life, the bureaucracy or civil service, or whatever you want to call it. Without that, you, we don't have a modern state. And in fact, um, someone was telling me recently that you know, the most powerful people in, for example, in the government of the state of Washington are not actually the people whom you elected to represent you, but are the heads of each individual department because they have the power to pass rules. And it's actually most of your life is governed by these rules, by people you didn't, you have not elected, and they have more rulemaking power than elected like, representatives who actually don't have that much to to do. So today, this is hugely, obviously important, powerful. This is what we consider to be the modern state. Everything that we have, you know, from electricity to whatever, all, even if it's contracted out, but it's all part of a background, an infrastructure that is provided by the modern state. We will continue with, uh, in the next lecture with a brief, brief overview of uh, how the administration, the administrative system uh, actually works in US, UK, France and Germany to see it in action briefly, to understand the different roles and how they fit into the given political system. <coughs> But then uh, we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, ideologies and political parties. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, again, uh, take notes and also use the, the textbook.